name is Kyle Kazan, and I'm honored to be moderating this afternoon's exciting and, in many ways, groundbreaking discussion about cannabis. Uh, who I am? I'm a California native who went to USC. I was a police officer who's spoken out against the drug war over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, my company forms and manages private funds to invest primarily in real estate globally, but now also in cannabis in California. Wow. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have assembled today an amazing panel who I know you will enjoy listening to and learning from. Our panel and timing have lined up amazingly today. Yesterday, Rohrbacher Farr, the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment was passed into law. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, Congressman Rohrbacher is here and can and will be explaining. Uh, last Friday, the draft marijuana regulations for the state of California were released. And the head of that is Lori Ajax. And she is here. <laughs> there was a discussion seemingly every day about o the opioid epidemic in the United States along with the addiction and death associated. There is a small but growing movement of plant over pills. Dr. Daniel Piamelli is here with his expertise, as is Dr. Menard. So we have, we are covering all the bases for science and law. Dana Rohrbacher, currently serving his 13th term in Congress. Dana Rohrbacher represents California's scenic 48th district, which is in Orange County. He graduated from Palos Verdes High School, which is the best high school in the world since I also graduated from there. Uh, he attended Harvard Junior College and received his bachelor's degree in history from Long Beach uh, State in 1969. He received his master's degree from the University of Southern California, also the best university in the world. <laughs> Congressman Rohrbacher has been a champion of states' rights issue for marijuana. He is one of the founders of the Cannabis Caucus in Congress. His Rohrbacher Farr Amendment first introduced 14 years ago in 2003 and finally passed in 2014, prohibits the Justice Department from spending funds to interfere with the implementation of state medical marijuana laws. This was the first time either Chamber of Congress had voted to protect medical marijuana patients. Dr. Daniel Piamelli is an Italian-born American scientist. He received his PhD from Columbia in neuroscience as postdoc at Rockefeller University. Daniel joined the University of California, Irvine, where he is now Louise Turner Arnold Chair in Neurosciences and Professor of Anatomy and Neurobiology, Pharmacology, and Biological Chemistry. You guys should try to read all that. He is editor-in-chief of Cannabis and Cannaboid, Cannabinoid Research, the only peer-reviewed journal entirely dedicated to the study of cannabis, its derivatives, and the endogenous counterparts in the human body. He was quoted in the documentary Ride with Larry. I think it was a surprise to him. It's worth a view if you haven't seen it. And has since become an internet sensation. He deserves a round of applause, too. <laughs> and Lori Ajax. Lori Ajax is the chief of the Bureau of Medical Cannabis Regulations. Appointed by Governor Brown in February 2016, she was previously Chief Deputy Director of the California Department of Alcohol Beverage Control, or ABC, so every liquor store, bar, restaurant, where she had served in multiple positions for over 22 years, including Deputy Division Chief, District Administrator, and Supervising Investigator. Lori spent 10 years in private industry prior to her state government career. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminal Justice from Cal State University, Sacramento. She is the marijuana czar in the state of California. Lori flew in today from her office in Sacramento. Well, I just got back from uh, Washington last night and uh, it is always nice to be home. I live right across the Back Bay there in Costa Mesa and uh, 
you know, I'm going to you, I, you've noticed that I have this arm sling on, and uh, just so you'll know, uh, no, they did not try to twist my arm to go to the other side on this issue. <laughs> and uh, I know that happens sometimes. You know, I was uh, uh, at a reunion recently, and uh, this guy was telling me the story about the fella who had all of his high school chums uh, visit him uh, and host a little party for them. 20 years later after they graduated from high school, and this guy had been fabulously successful at a beautiful home and a swimming pool and everything, and he took about uh, 20 of his buddies out and, and the pool was covered, and he said, uh, I wanna show you all something, and uh, uh, he puts, pushes the button, and the covers come off the swimming pool, and there the pool is filled with alligators and sharks and pythons and all sorts of horrible, uh, animals and uh, anyway he said look I really wanted to do something for you and and, uh, and show who's the most courageous we always had to prove who is the most courageous well I will give a million dollars to any of you who will jump in that pool and swim to the end and they're all looking at each other and nobody steps forward of course says okay I didn't think any of you were gonna take that deal come on down we got a barbecue down here and as they go down for the barbecue here's a splash and he looks into the pool and there's a guy swimming across the pool beating away the sharks and the alligators finally he crawls up on the end of the pool and the guy says my god I didn't think anybody would do it but you're gonna get your million dollars and he says I don't care about the million dollars I want to find out who pushed me in that pool <laughs> Uh, so here I am in Washington. I don't know what that has to do with shark pools, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, sometimes uh, Washington can be a shark pit for people who are principled, and I have tried to be principled, which means that I make people on the liberal side of the end of the spectrum mad at me half the time, really mad at me, and people on the conservative end of the spectrum really mad at me half the time. But that's okay. I mean, I believe in what I'm doing, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? And one thing that I believe in is I believe that this country was founded on the ideal of individual freedom and liberty, and it is up to adults to determine for themselves what they consume on their property, period. Zero. That's what freedom is. And, uh, and this idea uh, of ideal where we have limited government, and where you have individual personal responsibility for themselves, for ourselves, this idea where you have uh, constitutional rights and you have criminal law being handled at one end of, uh, locally and not at the, at the federal level, these are all fundamental things that our country is supposed to be about. And uh, uh, these are uh, what a lot of people have been talking about, doctor-patient relationship. That's another principle that we've always lived with the doctor-patient relationship. Marijuana laws in this country have violated every basic principle this country stands for for the last 75 years. It's time to stop it. And um, so, well, I have always voted for uh, liberalizing med med marijuana laws, whether medical or adult use marijuana. Uh, this is, there, as we all know, there are serious uh, side effects to having something outlawed like marijuana, and, uh, and that is uh, we end up with a situation where money that would be going to uh, local clinics or whatever or, or financing a regular business now end up in the hands of drug cartels in different parts of the world, undermining democratic institutions. So there's actually a byproduct uh, that is felt elsewhere. And also, of course, uh, we have basically turned uh, the police uh, into a situation where they now have an excuse to stop just about anybody and frisk them, which I do think is not what our founding fathers had in mind for freedom when they talked about liberty and justice for all. And of course, they never, do, and they never foresaw a federal police force like, like we've established now with the DEA coming into local communities, bashing down doors, trying to excuse this by the fact that somebody has a little baggie of, of weeds 
for Pete's sakes, and see, uh, you know, this is why we were able to go in and bash down that door. Then we end up, what, giving military equipment to people who are coming into our own communities? It's ridiculous. And so this has had a very serious negative impact, more than just the individual freedom, but individual freedom was enough for me. So with that said, I've been trying to vote this way, and I failed for many years. I've been in Congress now 28 years. But I finally found the formula with some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, on the Democratic side of the aisle. And uh, that formula was, Republicans believe in states' rights, the 10th Amendment. They always talk about it. So I said, let's challenge them. Uh, let's say that if a state legalizes the use of medical marijuana, the federal government cannot use the funds that we have to supersede what the people of that state have already decided. And uh, that, <laughs> that amendment, that amendment, because instead of doing the job ourselves and saying this is the law for the whole country, we left it up to the states. And with that, in 2014, I was able to pass what they call the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment which, uh, and I'll give you the exact numbers of the, of the vote, which was uh, 219 to 189. So what does that tell you? That's a pretty close vote. I, uh, what made the difference was that we had Republicans coming over and supporting the idea of states' rights. And without that, we would not have had the success that we've had. And since that time, of course, we've had these years since 2014 till now, where we've had uh, a, a new industry being created based on the idea that you have states' rights and the people of 45 states have somewhat modified, if not totally legalized, the use of medical marijuana. Uh, we just recently, uh, as, you, as was announced uh, yesterday, uh, was a big day because I, uh, Obviously, I had to work to see that the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment, which says the federal government isn't going to interfere, I had to work really hard to make sure it was in the omnibus bill, which is a, a bill of all sorts of things put together to keep the federal government running till October. Now, uh, it didn't, so the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment didn't just appear by magic, you know, I had to really run around and talk to people and twist arms and all the rest. <laughs> so, uh, and they, uh, of course, uh, we managed to succeed. And let me just note that yesterday we succeeded in, in placing Rohrbacher Farr again, uh, uh, making sure the law was in, that we, it's legal in those states where people want to use medical marijuana where the states have made it legal. Uh, that happened, it just happened the same day as National Prayer Day. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll just, as a believer, I say further proof of the existence of God. We won that one. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> so what is the, uh, what do we stand now and what's, uh, why, why we must do things? Look, uh, the, the side, one of the side effects of all of this control, you see, there are certain people who believe in the nanny state. They believe that government should be watching out for us. Even in our personal decisions, you know, we gotta have, you can't buy a big glass of Coke, it has to be a medium-sized glass of Coke now. No, no, I don't believe in that, but a large number, both conservatives and liberals, believe that we're gonna try to watch out for people by controlling their own decisions over their own lives. And we now have to make sure that that benevolent, uh, feeling and reason for being involved does not oversee what we consider to be personal freedom and liberty. And there's been serious consequences to that. And one of the serious consequences has been we have not done the medical research on the, on the cannabis plant that we should have. I mean, th th there's no reason in the world why a cannabis plant has not been the focus of major research to see if it can help us people in various uh, situations. Why is it that we can do research on opium, but we can't do research on cannabis? How stupid is that? 
so anyway, uh, I have, uh, you know, there's a, uh, an, an epidemic now, as we know, in opiates across this country. And I'm going to leave, leave you with one story and just say, we, we need to make sure every member of the House, if you have a, uh, if you're not in my district, uh, make sure you contact your member of the House to support this, 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 this situation with us. That's really important for you to do. Second of all, there was a statement issued by the President of the United States, uh, I think it was today, uh, explaining why he did sign into law uh, the omnibus bill and that reflecting directly on the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment. And he stated, uh, some people in the cannabis community think it's a little bit uh, uh, nebulous, and it is nebulous. Every time you get involved with, with lawyers and politicians, things are going to be nebulous so people can maneuver. But, uh, but nebulous doesn't mean we've lost doesn't mean we've lost ground, it just means it's nebulous, and it's up to us to try to make sure that people go the right course. Uh, and it, the president said that he would, uh, uh, he noted our, the amendment, and then he noted that, uh, uh, but he will be enforcing the law. Now, does he mean enforcing the law as, uh, as uh, Rohrbacher Farr, or does he mean the law that makes marijuana illegal federally? Well, there's a contradiction there. However, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and several other courts have sided with us saying it is clear that the intention of Congress now is that federal agents shall not go out and try to supersede state law in those, in those states where they've legalized medical marijuana. So for the president actually to enforce the law, at least up until the, the, the Circuit Court of Appeals level, the court system is siding with us and not with those people who would just take us back to the dark ages where your lives are all going to be controlled for your benefits, you know. No, that's not going to, hopefully, we're going to, that, if we have to, in fact, if we have to take it all the way to the Supreme Court, we will win. We will win on this because we have already gone through several court layers and the judges understand that that's the intent of Congress and that is thus the law. So don't freak out when you're, here, when you look at the president's statement and think that, well, that leaves open other alternatives. It does, but we have other forces at play as well, legal forces. Now, I'm going to leave you with that and let others get up and, and talk, but I want to leave you with, with uh, uh, one story, and uh, some of you have heard me tell that story, but I'm going to tell it, finish it tonight in, in a different way. And that is, uh, as most of you know, I was elected, uh, mainly I was elected 28 years ago, because I had been Ronald Reagan's principal speechwriter in the White House for seven years. And that sort of impressed people here. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I had no money. <clears throat> I had no name ID, because when you're a speechwriter for the president, you're, you're supposed to be a ghostwriter, and I, I held that standard. And so I had no money and no name ID, but I had 50 pictures of myself with Ronald Reagan. <laughs> And I won by a landslide, of course, with the, and my people, they all outspent me, et cetera. Well, uh, so I was elected as, as the Reagan Republican. And even, you know, I, tell you, I had a beard then, and uh, so that was really cool. They elected me even though I had a beard. <laughs> and and I, I had to shave it because my wife, well, before, right before we got married, she, she, she pulls this one on me. You know, I'm not gonna get married to a man with a beard, you know. <laughs> Come on, you know, the wedding's two weeks away. Shave the beard. Okay, so I shaved the beard, and I remember I was walking downtown in uh, Huntington Beach, and I said to myself, you know, my constituents, they remember, they all know me with the beard. You know, Reagan, uh, Rohrbacher's the guy with the beard next to Reagan. And so I said, well, I'm going to walk down and talk to some voters, and, and I stopped this guy and said, hey, I'm running for Congress and I want your vote. And the guy looks at me and says, you got it, buddy, that bearded bum who represents us now. <laughs> <laughs> but let me leave you with one this last thought. I didn't know what this would mean for me. All I knew is I believed in individual freedom, and I believe in what our founding fathers had in mind for our country. That's all I knew when I got involved with this particular issue. And I did know that I had some very conservative supporters and didn't know how they would react. So <clears throat> there was a guy who came into my office who was a, uh, a retired military officer who is now in aerospace 
And I asked him, and he, my, he was the typical Rohrbacher voter, so I said, okay, uh, how do you feel about the fact that the guy you've been supporting all this time is the point person for legalizing medical marijuana in the United States? And he looked at me and he said, Dana, uh, you don't really know me that well, do you? And I said, well, I you're in the military and a pilot and now you're in aerospace. And he says, yeah, but you, what you don't know is I have three sons. Two of them, uh, or three of them, uh, marched off the day after 9-11 and signed up for the military, okay? And so I said, yeah. He said, a couple of years later, two of them came home. The third one who came home wasn't my son anymore. He was on the ground in convulsions. And what could I do? And, uh, and he said, nothing we did could help him. And, uh, and, and he said, we took him to the VA, and by the way, this is sinful that we don't allow the VA to handle anything that can help our veterans should be given to them. To keep safe. So, you know, we went to the VA, and he says, it wasn't helping them, and they kept giving him, giving him these other things that may turn him into a zombie. And finally, after a year, he said, some guy from the VA pulled us aside, come and see me downtown. We did. He said, look, I can't tell you this, at the VA property, but uh, he said, uh, you, your son needs marijuana. Here's a prescription, here's how to use it. And he says, you know, my son hasn't had a seizure since that day. Now, now, he said, so I'm gonna come over and give you a hug, okay? But he called me a couple days ago. So if you guys have heard that story before, he called me a, a couple days ago. And how is your son? Are the seizures still gone? He says, yeah, the seizures are still gone, but there's a problem. I said, what's the problem? Well, the VA has got him addicted to these opiates, and he's like a zombie. And they want to, and when they try to take him off, they, they're insisting that they, he stops using the, mar the marijuana as well, and the seizures come back. This is outrageous. This is insane. And I will tell you right now, uh, uh, the oh, and then, here's what he told me, he says, and, and we're in a crisis and we need your help. His son was there and they were trying to get him off of opiates and then they're demanding he takes care of everything which is gonna throw him into a seizure. So he went out in the car uh, to consume some cannabis. Now, the people who guard our VA hospitals, uh, the, the, the parking lot, are federal employees and they arrested him. And they said, will you help? And of course I'm going to help, for God's sakes. This is, a, this is the type of nonsense and, and just inhumane ignorance that comes when people are trying to run other people's lives for them. Yeah, everybody can be well. I'm sure the people who made these uh, decisions were well intended, just like those congressmen who voted for one of the bills we put up that said the VA will be free to, uh, to prescribe me mar medical marijuana in those states where medical marijuana is legal, and that was defeated by like three or four votes. Now, I'm not, those people who voted against that, they were not mean-spirited, they don't want this man to suffer, but we now know we have to get the word to these people that the, not only the veterans, but our senior citizens and, every, and lots of other people are suffering because of this effort on their part to protect them from themselves. How stupid is that? We are smarter than that, but they all have good souls. You know, we're not telling, telling you these are evil people doing this. No, it's not. We need to reach out to those people and change the law and give freedom to our people and give some help to those people who are suffering who cannabis can help. So God bless you. Thank you very much. So first, I'm gonna to go to Dana. I'm not gonna ask about the pool and the snakes and the crocodiles. Um, so a lot of people in here are thinking, they're either in the business, thinking about getting the business, um, and the question I get asked most often is, Jeff Sessions, what do we think Mr. Sessions might do? Has he tipped his hand, coal letter, that kind of thing? Uh, Jeff Sessions. Uh, Jeff Sessions is a very good friend of mine. I've known him for 30 years. Uh, he's, uh, in fact, more than that. I actually uh, 
met him when I was still a teenager, and he was a teenager, and we were involved in conservative organizations. And every one of the conservative organizations that we were part of uh, uh, stressed uh, the constitutional government, including the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, uh, which leaves things like this up to the states. And I have reminded him of that many times. <laughs> and uh, so uh, <laughs> let me just note, uh, he, he is an honest man and a person who's got a good heart. And just like a lot of people who want to help you along by telling you what to do with your personal life, they are very well motivated in that they really have good hearts. They're, they think they're helping you out. And Jeff the, thinks that how horrible it is when he's seen, you know, he came up in the 60s and saw people who were, you know, <laughs> getting really wild. And that's impacted on his vision of what it's going to be like. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to tell him that, yes, normal people and actually people you like, like veterans and senior citizens and a lot of other people, not just young people wanting to get wild, uh, need to have the freedom to use cannabis. And that should be up to the state government and the people therein. Uh, quite frankly, I am, uh, if I was here not as a federal representative, I wouldn't think I'd want as much regulation as we're talking about here in the state of California. Uh, but that's up to you, not up to me. And, uh, the, uh, but Jeff Sessions, uh, I talked to him, I will have to admit, I talked to him yesterday uh, and uh, on a number of subjects. This was one of them. And we have agreed that we're going to have a meeting where we will in-depth look at this issue. And uh, you can just rest assured, I don't know if you... Uh, after listening to me speak, if I hope that you trust the fact that well, I learned my lessons about communications from Ronald Reagan, the, the great communicator, and I will put all of those to work to try to expand the realm of freedom for you to live your lives and those people who want to use cannabis to go right ahead and use it, adults, to use that cannabis. I will do everything I can in that discussion with Jeff to push freedom for us. And I'll do my best, and I can't tell you, I can, I, I can only predict this. If Jeff Session goes the wrong way and convinces the president to reverse his position in the campaign, remember, the president specifically said in the campaign, medical marijuana should be legal and adult use should be left up to the states. He said that several times. Now, if Jeff, uh, just convince the president to renege on that. I'm sorry, but I will tell you this much. I will tell him that I have no doubt that it will go to the courts and, then, and, the, and the circuit court, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has already verified our position on this and we don't expect other judges to find fault with those with that decision. So it will be a huge waste of his time and money and why would he do that? So I'll make the case. We'll see what happens. Dana. So what is your advice to people in the business, thinking about entering the business, growing a few plants at home, or if I put out something and said you should invest with me, what advice would you give those people today in 2017 in, in May of 2017 the issue has not been definitely settled yet so people who are putting money out there are entrepreneurs who are putting money into the cannabis business and especially the medical dispensary business and they are taking a great risk uh, there are profits that should come from risks that's, that's as simple as that. This is the way the free enterprise system works. And uh, I would hope that uh, no one here begrudges them once it uh, becomes legal in this state. And if we manage to secure the, uh, uh, this uh, arena uh, from federal intervention, I hope no one here uh, begrudges these people the right to make a profit 
and I know this is the Republican part of my personality coming out here, but you have a lot of people right now are taking great risks in order to get medical marijuana to people who need it. And yes, uh, they should, uh, if, if we move forward, which is not certain yet, I mean, uh, uh, not only Jeff Sessions, but who knows? Uh, uh, even, I don't have to tell you folks, but during Obama and now even during Jerry Brown, uh, I have not gotten the cooperation from the Democrat side that I thought I was gonna get. I mean, uh, we, the, the, the uh, Attorney General's office under Obama did, was not supportive of the efforts that I was making. Uh, we made that despite what was going on with the president and the attorney general then. And, of course, Jerry Brown has not stepped up to the plate either. So you don't have uh, it settled yet. And as if you folks are going to move forward, remember, it's uh, with that, with what I just said, that means the future is not charted. We will make the future. That's the great thing about this country. Those of us in this room, the... Freedom belongs to the activists, and I would hope that we all know that we have to be very active in with our, with our elected officials, and by doing that, we will protect the free, our freedom to consume, but also, just as important, the right of people investing now to make a profit so that they have done the right thing in providing us the cannabis that people uh, want to consume for their medical reasons. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what it was. How can our representatives protect cannabis stakeholders from federal intervention if local law enforcement can be deputized as federal agents? Well, you, we have to go to the courts. You know, the court has to determine what is the law. And uh, if you would deputize some local uh, person to become a federal agent, at that point, that person, if, if it is the, uh, if we're talking about the Department of Justice, at this moment, and at least until October of this year, and hopefully we'll get it renewed, uh, that that person will be breaking the law, and uh, whether and if that person is now on the fe a federal law enforcement officer working under the control of the Department of Justice. I'm sorry, the courts uh, I have written along with uh, a majority of other members of Congress written into the law that state law will be respected. And whether or not they're trying to get around it by uh, deputizing a, a local, uh, local uh, law enforcement or not, they still come under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. So I don't think there's any way they can escape that. Again, however, this may be decided in court. And so far, uh, you know, I've had to actually, when we're talking about whether or not these various political figures that we would have hoped would have been more on our side on this issue, whether it's Jerry Brown or, or, or Obama, uh, I was hoping they would be, but we, I've had to end up calling judges. I literally have had to call judges and write judges saying, by, in the last few years, when these people have been in power, and they, util and they actually ignore the fact that we have put this in a restriction into the appropriations bill, and I've had to call judges and say, look, if you have a federal prosecutor in your court today and he is prosecuting someone who's involved with the medical use of marijuana and this state uh, and your state has legalized the medical use of marijuana, there is only one criminal in your court and that is the, the uh, guy who is the prosecutor, not the defendant. And uh, so... And, and quite frankly, I remember doing that once, and a, the Federal Court of Appeals backed me up on that in this particular case. So uh, we, what's the answer? The answer is uh, they try to do things like that. We'll have to go to the courts. And uh, as long as we have this coalition between the 68 Republicans who believe 
in states' rights and the Constitution, and the Democrats on the other side of the aisle, who, by the way, I think are motivated by the fact their political base wants that, which is there's nothing wrong with that in a democracy. First, go, go for your political base. So that coalition is the one who's writing the law now, not the people in the executive branch. Their job is to enforce the law after it's made by the elected representatives. So there you go. My uh, question is for the congressman. There's a lot of talk of today about doing research, and my group is ready to do just that. We're funding the next four years of the Technion in Israel's uh, research on cancer, and we have a top top pediatric hospital in the country ready to do seven different clinical trials with us and over a thousand children. As you may know, the University of Mississippi, Mississippi that has the contract with NIDA to provide companies like mine with flour is growing what I call weed. It's contaminated, it's poor quality, many universities have dropped out of clinical research, it's being cited on papers that they think their, their trials were of poor quality because of the poor flour that they had to, to use. What kind of advice can you give someone like myself and my organization who desperately needs our own DEA grow license, none of which have been handed out yet. What can we do in order to change these regulations or get a better policy in place so we can get a federal DEA license to grow quality cannabis for dying patients? Yeah, the, uh, the, great, the greatest sin that I think has been committed uh, in this whole era of where people want the government to be the nanny government and take care of our lives and thus have perpetuated what I consider to be fascistic controls over our personal lives. The worst effect of that has been is that we have basically restricted the knowledge base that we have on this plant. This, if we learn in the future through opening up, and we need to open this up dramatically, this research, you're right, the Mississippi thing, that is a disgrace. That is a national disgrace that we have left one university with limited amount of, of ability to, get, to look into this issue. Uh, and if we learn in the future, which I believe uh, the evidence seems to indicate that there are some real uses, you know, it's anecdotal now, but we need to prove that. But when that is proven, I, I think that we need to look back on these people who have ignored uh, the potential goodness of this uh, in order to save us from ourselves. They're going to save us wonderful. They're going to control our lives, and uh, that's what happens. When, when Anyway, I will fight to make sure that research dollars... By the way, just let me tell you this. I don't... People come to me every day uh, with a disease they want to have... Uh, that they, they want to have researched every day. And I say, I'm not going to focus on one disease. I'm not going to do that. I'm not gonna, but I will support increases in the general level of research in this country, which I always have. And I believe that when we look at the general level of research, we need to make sure that that we don't eliminate areas. They have a, some people want us just to focus on their particular problem, but it, when it comes to cannabis, we've eliminated an area of honest investigation. So uh, you can count on some of us there. There's a lot of people now that are, that are aware that uh, I am so proud that the Israeli government has taken the lead on this, but I think at the same time I'm proud of them I'm ashamed of our own government for not b being taking that same stand on open research into this a long time ago. So thank you. Okay, I just wanted to make one uh, one comment c concerning the uh, the Schedule One issue and the and the University of Mississippi. Uh, I, I know very well uh, the people at the University of Mississippi. Uh, I, they're very respectable the scientists and everything. The, the issue is that really. Uh, we can't do research in the current regulatory scenario. That's all I have to say. We, we cannot, uh, Schedule 1 seems like a, uh, the schedule system seems like a reasonable, logical regulatory system. It is completely illogical and it's completely wrong. And the only thing that it actually uh, achieves is to really blocking, preventing researchers from doing their job because everybody else who wants to use it 
don't really care. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I want to reassert uh, again what the doctor just said. And I'm sorry, Hillary Clinton wanting to reschedule, that means nothing. The fact is it could end up a disaster if it's not rescheduled the right way. It's better to, if someone says deschedule, all right, let's think about that. But uh, we, could, we, could, we, could end up, we could end up with a worse situation if it's just rescheduling. We literally could end up where there's less research and, there's, and that the, there's further controls over each and every one of us here. So we gotta be very, very careful when we're talking about rescheduling.